Father Athanasius McVeigh, church historian. Thanks so much for joining us today on Javad TV. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. Slava Navike. So uh, you're a historian of the church. You've done a lot of really interesting books uh, about uh, our church. Um, many times uh, you research the church outside of Ukraine even, which is a very kind of a, a specific topic. A lot of people turn their focus to Ukraine, but you look at the church often outside of Ukraine, in Vatican archives and elsewhere. And right now you're working on a project about the history of the church in the UK. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the origin stories? How did the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church end up in the UK? Well, thank you, Julian, for the invitation and, and to everyone at Jeveta Labachina, which um, is a wonderful initiative here. I'm actually doing a Canadian project right now, but I, I have written a manuscript on on uh, which is just an editing right now on the history of uh, Ukrainian uh, we call it Ukrainian Catholic Church in the diaspora, but you know, Ukrainian Greek Catholic was the, is the historical term and the term in used in Ukraine legally. So, uh, so well, um, I think that um, you know this is a, an, an an emigration story. You know, our our church is on five continents of the world. I think I counted right five, at least four, but I think five. And, you know, at the end of the 19th century, so the, the 1800s, uh, there, you know, the conditions in, um, in Austria-Hungary and the Russian Empire, but uh, we're talking about for the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church at that time, it's just Austria-Hungary because it was illegal in, in uh, the part of Ukraine, most of Ukraine, which was in the Russian Empire. So in Austria-Hungary, there were the social conditions and uh, freedom that people were allowed to uh, emigrate and um, look for uh, <clears throat> a better life. And I think there had been a, a improved high hygiene and social conditions to, uh, in that period that had uh, caused a population boom. So there was a, a lack of land. And, you know, your, uh, well, your ancestors, I think, came a little bit later after the Second World War, maybe, but my ancestors came to Canada in uh, 1907. So in that period of between, you know, sort of in the 18... 80s to 1920, there was a huge uh, emigration, uh, you know, from Galicia, Austria-Hungary uh, to uh, Western Europe, mainly to uh, North and South America. And it seems that, um, you know, between 1893 and 1912, uh, about 500 Ukrainians from uh, the Zolochu district, especially Bile Kami, uh, left uh, Austria-Hungary and were headed towards Canada or the United States. But, you know, you took the boat. They had to stop in England. And I think they, uh, from Liverpool or wherever the port was, uh, I think Liverpool is closer to Manchester, probably not Southampton. Uh, for some reason, they didn't get on the boat. Uh, they stopped there, whether they ran out of money or the information about that uh, first group of people is a little sparse. Father Yevhen Nebesnyak has written a little bit about it. I did a little bit of research, but um, about 500 people settled in the Manchester uh, industrial area, you know, uh, and uh, they didn't have any clergy, not like Canada and the United States, where after about five, 10 years, you know, uh, Greek Catholic priests and uh, religious members of brothers and sisters started to come over because the people said, you know, we need we need our church here. We need our, our clergy as well to be, we can't, we're not a whole church unless we have, with the laity, we also need our clergy. Even and Metropolitan Andrei Sheptetsky wrote a letter to the faithful in Canada. I mean, he was very kind of familiar, it would, it would seem, with, with the number of our, of, of our people who, who were living there at the time. Indeed, I, I, I was going to say that um, Metropolitan Shiptiski came through uh, England in 1921 uh, when he was on his grand tour of the Western world. Uh, it was mainly an economic tour. Uh, uh, Western Ukraine, or Galicia, as it was called under Austria, was really devastated after the First World War. And he was collecting um, funds for orphans, for children, and uh, for other uh, charitable purposes, but also uh, because it was an issue of of, of justice and of um, you could say human rights, uh, that the um, Ukrainians once that area passed under the Polish Republic, there was a lot of discrimination 
Uh, so he was lobbying for some kind of, whether it's independence or even autonomy, some kind of uh, autonomy to, and his main concern was, uh, you know, for the church as, as the protector of those people. So that the church was actually in danger of being completely, um, you know, forcibly uh, extinguished uh, during the Polish-Ukrainian war. So he stopped there. And after Metropolitan Szeptyski's visit to, uh, to England, he went to Manchester. I mean, the, that was the only community. Uh, he, uh, you know, when he went back home, he started to discuss with the other uh, churchmen and the church leaders about, well, these people, they don't have any clergy. They attend the local, most of them, the local Roman Catholic Church, St. Chad's in Manchester. Uh, and, um, you know, they need some clergy. So, uh, but that group of people assimilated very quickly. They had their Ukrainian club, but they didn't have, unlike the North Americans, they didn't build their own church. So by 1930, uh, they had dwindled to about 89 families of sort of conscious, you know, Ukrainians, Ukrainian Catholics. And uh, they began to send itinerant missionaries over there. So there was a father, Louis Vandenbosch, who was a Belgian redemptorist in France, would come over three times a year and serve the Divine Liturgy, marry some people. Uh, the first Ukrainian Catholic wedding in Britain was performed by him around that time in the 30s. Uh, you know, Patriarch Yosef, uh, you know, Joseph Slipe, who was the rector of the seminary and the, uh, the academy, uh, came through there as well in 1937, uh, um, August, I see here, of 1937, on his way to, uh, uh, to Ireland um, to parlay with the, uh, the Catholic universities in Ireland, because, of course, the project for the Ukrainian Catholic University uh, in Lviv, Slipe was the Shuptitsky's chosen instrument to, to make that happen. And, uh, and also a uh, blessed Mikola Chernetsky uh, came through there in, around that time, 1937. Big names. Yeah. So um, that father Van den Bosch died uh, in 1938 uh, of poor health. And he was replaced by a man named Jacques Peridon, who was a Dutchman uh, who um, had studied in, when Szeptycki came to Holland in 1921, he, you know, made a great impression on many people in the West. And Perry John fell in love with the ideal of the union. Szeptycki's, you know, this Catholic, but the Byzantine church to its fullest, but united with the whole church. So Perry Don was ordained a priest by Szeptycki and he eventually became the vice rector, the rector of the minor seminary in Lviv. But he ran into some problems in the 30s with the Polish government and had to return home. And uh, he eventually was put in charge of the Ukrainians in France and would make uh, periodic trips to England uh, in the 40s. Uh, then after the war, uh, a few military chaplains came over to serve that community, um, Canadian and the Polish Corps. Uh, and then by May 1944, there were already th 3 million displaced Ukrainians in Western Europe. Holy cow. That's yeah, like yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, uh, this was a, a, a situation. I mean, the, the, the people had been displaced from their native villages and cities and that. And, you know, these were Ukrainians from... The West, uh, Ukrainian Catholics mainly, uh, Ukrainians from other parts of Ukraine. So you had a different, you know, you could say dialects, uh, different kinds of Ukraine, different... Uh, Regionalisms? Or yeah, you know, mixed together in these refugee camps, different religions. And this was, uh, you know, kind of a, 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 you could say like a chemical reaction, but it was also a, 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 an encounter. It was, it was Catholics and Orthodox, for one thing, were, were close together like that uh, for the first time. There was a lot of political factionalism as well. Uh, by 1947, you had 25,000 uh, Ukrainians in Britain, and um, it as much as 30,000 the next year and even up to 40 in 1949, uh, about 20,000 of those who were Ukrainian Catholics. Um, most of those people were able to get uh, sponsorship to move on to the United States, Canada, Australia. Uh, uh, there were three groups of refugees. There was 10,000 of those were uh, in the Polish army, the Polish forces. Of course, Western Ukraine had been part of Poland until 1939, and, and many of our people had served in the Polish forces during the war. Uh, 8,000 of them were from the uh, Ukrainian division, uh, or the, had been the Galician division, which had been in the German army. 
and had been interned in Italy, but were, were accepted by Britain uh, to repatriate it to, to the UK. And 7,000 were uh, European voluntary workers that the Ministry of Labor in Britain uh, invited to come to help with the, the uh, labor in the, the decimated uh, economy after the war. Uh, for our church, a huge um, factor here, you know, of course, the, the bishops had been arrested in Ukraine. The primate Metropolitan Andrei had died, and of course, uh, Metropolitan Yosef Slipe had succeeded, but they were all arrested. Now, the one bishop remained outside of uh, Ukraine at that time, and it was uh, Bishop Ivan Buchko. He was the auxiliary bishop of in Lviv, and he was sent on an inspection or an apostolic visitation to South America. Um, in 1939, just before the war broke out, and he got stuck. They, he couldn't get back. Uh, so he ended up as a refugee himself. Uh, and in 1945, he was appointed by Pope Pius XII to be the apostolic visitor for Ukrainians in Italy. And then the next year, it was extended to all of Western Europe with this huge phenomenon of all these displaced people. And, you know, there's different kinds of apostolic visitors, but he was given very extensive authority, actual jurisdiction over the clergy and the faithful. So he was like an exarch in all but name. Uh, but obviously with the situation, he had to be in touch with the local Roman Catholic bishops in every local place. The people had no buildings, no churches, no institutions. So uh, he was very much uh, in touch with them and, and asking for their help and cooperation. I can't um, even imagine the challenge of that. Uh, I mean, I, I, people are, are surprised when, for example, my eparchy spans two thirds of the United States, uh, but that's one country. This is a bishop who, before the age of, of the internet, uh, is is effectively uh, serving faithful in in several different countries, and he's the Millions. only guy doing it. I mean, I can't even imagine yeah. what our church would look like. Without I don't know how this man didn't drop dead because he, if you saw the amount of letters he wrote, uh, external, internal, I mean, I just, it boggles the mind how this man, uh, the energy, and he did actually get very sick in 1952, but uh, uh, he, he made three uh, initial trips to Britain to start his apostolic visitation. Um, in, in January 1947, he came to London and he presented this decree of Pope Pius XII to the local hierarchy. Uh, the, 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 from that date, um, see, third to, 4th to 5th of January, I have here that he presented the decree to the de facto primate of, of the Catholic Church in Britain, the Archbishop of Westminster, Cardinal Griffin, and the Apostolic Delegate Cardinal Godfrey, uh, from that date, that's the canonical date when our church as a, as a canonical structure is established because we have a hierarch, a hierarch with jurisdiction over our faithful and clergy, even though he's the apostolic visitor, but from that's the canonical established before it's just faithful under the Roman Catholic bishop. So from that date, we have an established uh, church there. Uh, and um, he, so he goes up to Manchester and London. That's all there is, really. Then there's camps are starting to form. In November of the same year, he comes back and gets permission to visit all the camps uh, and hostels that have, have set up. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm thinking of the date when the Divisio was brought over. Um, I think that was, yeah, I think that was, um, was that 47 or 48? But then eventually he starts visiting those POW camps because they're there for about a year before they're released. Uh, and he gets in contact with all the local Roman Catholic bishops, all the local Ukrainian uh, leaders. Um, he starts importing clergy. So uh, all from there's four chaplains in the Divisia. There's two that were smuggled over with the Divisia in German uniforms that he actually, the British army asked him to do that because they says these four chaplains are not enough for your soldiers who are going to become integrated after in the society. So uh, get more volunteers. So he got two more volunteers. They came over. Then he started importing priests that were in the refugee camps in Germany. And he got another, he asked for 15, but he got another six. Uh, so it was up to, I think, 15 in total by the end of 1948. 
uh, at that time, he blessed the first church uh, building, which was purchased by the Archbishop of Westminster for us, a little church in a part of London called Saffron Hill. It's in Charles Dickens. It was a you know very poor area of the city. At, and uh, then he had the first clergy conference on the 29th to the 30th of December, uh, you know, 1948. And at that time, the the plan to divide the country in pastoral zones with one or two priests responsible, that was the beginning of that. So that's the beginning of the church. Wow. That's a heck of a story. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you a, a little bit about how we got to where we are today. You mentioned uh, that um, these terms like uh, apostolic visitor, uh, exarchate, uh, and now uh, there's an eparchy in, in London. Uh, what do these terms mean technically, and, and how do we get to where we are now? Books, <laughs> Naya. Uh, these are, are terms, uh, I think they have to reference to kind of the, the juridical structure. I mean, on what level of, you know, what level of church is this, and how does the, the church define? Um, Apostolic visitor is for very much a transient thing. You know, they're not sure what's going to, it's an overseer. It's like an inspector. But as I said, he had a lot more powers than just an ordinary apostolic visitor. Uh, a, a, an exarchate is like a missionary diocese and an eparchy, which it's only been an eparchy since 2013 in the UK. Uh, so there, it was the same all over the diaspora. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Pope and the, the Apostolic See, which is the technical name for the Pope and his curious bureaucracy. Sometimes they say Holy See, although that's used a lot more for diplomatic relations, but they're both interchangeable. Was very upset of what happened when the communists they like to use the word liquidated. I don't think that works in English. I think it's suppressed our church. I mean, some were liquidated, but, uh, you know, so uh, we had a really great advocate on our side in Rome. His name was Eugène Tisserand. He was a, a, a scholar. He had worked in the Vatican Library. He was a very close friend of, of Pope Pius XI, who had been the Vatican librarian. Um, and uh, he was an Orientalist, so he uh, his area of specialty was the Eastern churches, uh, and he was our advocate in Rome. And with Bishop Buchko stationed in Rome uh, as the go-to person, between the two of them, they cooked up a lot of great stuff for us. They helped not only our church, they gave aid to Ukrainians without distinction of, of religion. Uh, you know, for example, to uh, Metropolitan, the future Metropolitan Larion Ohienko benefited with uh, aid, you know, of uh, from the Congregation of the Eastern Church. As He's it was known, known for then. translating it's the not, Bible into Ukrainian, uh, correct? Uh, that's Ivan Khomenko. Khomenko. Uh, this is Larion who became the primate of the Ukrainian Greek, Catholic, Greek Orthodox Church of Canada and who had been the... Um, Minister of Education in the UNR, the brief UNR at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. But, uh, you know, the Pope, through his advisors, asked him, you know, what are we going to do about the, you know, these Greek Catholics? And the Pope promised we will, we will restore this church. The plan was to restore the church outside of the, the home territory in the immigration, in the diaspora, as they used to say. So, um, in 1952, Pius XII published this, uh, it's popularly known as the Charter of, of Migrants, and it's, the document was called, um, I think it was an apostolic letter, uh, called Exul Familia Nazaretana. So that's basically the, 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 the Nazarene family or the Holy Family in exile. And, and it, it, um, there were references to, to the Ukrainian Catholic Church in it and to the Eastern Catholic churches. And the, the, the emphasis was on the local Roman Catholic hierarchies were supposed to help the immigrants uh, preserve their, you know, their culture and traditions while integrating uh, into the, the um, reality of, of the, the countries where they had, had uh, immigrated. But that document caused a lot of trouble because I think, you know, for all the goodwill of the Pope, once his bureaucrats got a hold of it, uh, you know, and started issuing additional norms and things, 
uh, one department or the other, uh, the result was that local Roman Catholic dioceses started to try and suppress <laughs> the, the separate structure because they thought they interpreted it when it said the apostolic visitations are, you know, uh, national visitations are abolished. They thought that, you know, that was the Poles and the Hungarians, and they thought that also referred to our Bishop Buchko's <coughs> apostolic visitation. And um, in fact, uh, the, the ruling was no, because it doesn't talk about, in that clause, it doesn't talk about right. So uh, our visitation, and, and I think that was a signal. I think Bishop Buchko got scared and think, well, we've got to formalize these structures because, uh, you know, we'll be absorbed otherwise. So he, at, from that point on, began to ask for the, his visitation to be changed into an exarchate. Uh, and in the following year, uh, he said, um, well, not, not for all of Europe, but let's start in the United Kingdom, in Britain, because in Britain, uh, the people are more established. Uh, there's a large number, they're more financially secure. Uh, and so the Cardinal Tisserand asked the British Catholic hierarchy the next year, 1954, well, this is the plan. We have a plan to set up this apostolic exarchate, a, a structure for the uh, Greek. It included others as well. It was for what they called Ruthenian. It was a church term for which included Ukrainians and, and Rusins and, you know, uh, Bel Belarusians and others. Uh, <clears throat> in Great Britain. And what do you think? Well, the bishops all said, most of them said no. They said it's <laughs> this, it's working the way we've got it. Their priests are, you know, under us and we're uh, helping them financially and giving them the use of churches. And that was great, but we couldn't kind of couldn't move forward. You know, we really, really couldn't build anything of our own and, you know, have our own bishop who, who was, uh, knew the, our own law, because for example, uh, the marriage laws for the Eastern Catholic churches came out in the 50s, the first canons. And uh, so, for example, there was a kerfuffle because in England, uh, um, if you had married in a civil office first, you had to, you couldn't be married before the high altar. So you had to be married in the sacristy. That was the local law for the Latin church in England. But of course, Bishop Butchko said, well, there's a question of whether it's valid because our law requires it to be in, in, in the church, in a sacred place. So um, the bishop said no, uh, but Cardinal Tisserand uh, kind of was not expecting them to say no, said, well, thank you very much for your opinion, but <laughs> we're going to proceed with this. But uh, in order to make it more acceptable, he addressed some of their uh, concerns and he offered the post of, of exarch to the local uh, Latin primate, the Archbishop of Westminster, Cardinal Griffin, who accepted in 1955. Uh, but because the exarch was a uh, not a, a Greek Catholic, not a Ukrainian. Uh, Bishop Buchko was very concerned that the the uh, the faithful, who were very nationalistically minded, would reject this structure, and they could, you know, maybe leave the leave the church, leave the unity of the uh, of uh, the Catholic Communion. And so he says, "Wait, we need to prepare. I need to prepare a vicar general for you." that will basically assist you. And then maybe this vicar general can become an auxiliary bishop or, you know, eventually that was the plan. And it took him a little while to find anybody. It had to be someone who spoke English, you know, so someone from the, the States or, but the Cardinal said, no, I want someone from Canada because it's part of the Commonwealth. So <laughs> whatever, they finally found someone. And, um, but Cardinal Griffin died at the age of 57 from overwork the next year. So by the time his successor, who had been the apostolic delegate, Cardinal uh, Archbishop Godfrey, was now the Archbishop of Westminster. By the time he got himself settled, he then accepted the post and he was appointed the first exarch. The exarchate was created uh, on the 10th of June, 1957. Uh, and at the time it included also Carpatho Rusins uh, and Belarusians at the beginning. Uh, but it was only for England and Wales because <laughs> you see the, the man who was appointed was the primate of England and that jurisdiction ends on the border of Scotland and the English and the Scottish hierarchies very, you know, the twain shall not meet. So he couldn't have jurisdiction in Scotland, <clears throat> though there were Ukrainians in Scotland. <clears throat> it was technically uh, left kind of in limbo that question until our own uh, <coughs> hierarch was appointed. 
But um, uh, Bishop Puchko came over to do a handover ceremony in November 1957. The, the papal bull was read so that the people could see that our Ukrainian bishop, you know, was giving this over. And he had a vicar general named Father Maluga, who was a redemptress father from Canada. Uh, who arrived at the end of the year and for all intents and purposes was running the exarchate for the archbishop, you know. Hmm. <clears throat> then in 1961, an auxiliary bishop was appointed in the person of uh, Augustin Horniak, who was a, uh, who was a Brazilian uh, father from the States, but had been born in Yugoslavia. It was one of those, what they call them, Bachka, Bachko Rusins or Bachko Ruthenians. But he identified as Ukrainian. You know, he said that this Rusins, he, he, his own uh, view was that that was part of a greater uh, Ukrainian nation, which is why he, he was appointed. So it, it seems like the history of, of the church, um, there's a little bit of friction there uh, among people, but there's also a lot of friends that helped the church along. They got the church uh, established uh, far from Ukraine. Um, are there any lessons from that? Uh, it, it's it's not easy being a minority church. Uh, it's not easy uh, being an immigrant group or so. What can we learn from the legacy of these folks in in Britain and their uh, dedication to a church that is Ukrainian, that um, has its own right, that it, that doesn't get absorbed into a different right or or anything like that? Um, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, first of all, historians don't uh, pronounce on the present. So, uh, <laughs> but of course, you know, we're all human and we have different hats. Uh, historians have to be really careful not to read back into the past things for today and even vice versa. You know, there's that old uh, proverb, history is the teacher of life. But, um, you know, uh, I think that in different times, different periods or different conditions, uh, human beings are always human beings. So there are common factors. Uh, and, you know, I, I would say that looking back to the past, we can see maybe some problems that might be uh, issues that might be present even today or 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 any time perennial factors and one of them I think is the uh, you know looking at for example the history of, of our immigrations in Canada the United States uh, and other countries is that there's the issue of of um, assimilation now, assimilation is uh, is an unavoidable process unfortunately or fortunately, but I mean, it's, it's a fact. It's not something that can be stopped, but how do you handle it? How do you deal with it? You know, uh, when I was researching about the blessed Nikita Budka, his motto was kind of adaptation, not assimilation. So as much as possible, he knew that people were gonna assimilate out of their Ukrainian identity completely. So it, in order to kind of Stave that off a little bit. He encouraged the people adapt, like Shevchenko. You know, uh, learn the, the 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 ways of others, but don't forget your own. What's what's the the famous phrase? You know, uh, uh, learn, the learn the foreigners' ways, but do not forget your own. Yeah, and uh, and but I mean, you know. As far as the Ukrainian Catholic Church was concerned, the focus is, is how do you preserve Kievan Christianity, which is what our, our church is a part of, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a situation where the second and third generation or what, whatever point, most of them will cease identifying as Ukrainians uh, or cease speaking the language. Uh, so does that mean that they should then become cease identifying as Ukrainian Catholics or part of that Kievan church inheritance? Is that no longer relevant to them if they no longer identify as Ukrainians? And stop and, praying in the Byzantine rite and, uh, is, the, is the assumption that if you forget Ukrainian, as is often inevitable, or I mean, people try to avoid it, but statistically, 
extremely likely over generations people lose uh, language. Does that mean that uh, once you lose the language, you become Latin right as, as yeah. a default? And that's what the church really wanted to to uh, wanted to and wants to avoid is that our church is relevant for anybody. Now, of course, the church will help the faith will preserve their Ukrainian culture, their language, and other things. It's part of Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church because most of the clergy, you know, and the hierarchs and that came from Ukraine or, or have Ukrainian back in the church help with those things. And I think we, we were, were blessed uh, very much in having a church to help. But there is this other factor that's very important. How do we uh, continue to offer this uh, Ukrainian Greek Catholic experience when the people no longer feel Ukrainian? And uh, that's a great challenge. And I won't give any answers because I don't have the answers. Uh, but um, it's a thing that our church has grappled with in the past and has succeeded and failed and is grappling with in the present. Uh, and in the present in, in the United Kingdom, we have um, uh, our church is mostly uh, migrant workers. So they're mostly Ukrainian speaking people. And I would say a large number of them will probably return to, to Ukraine. So that is our most uh, numerous factor. But there are other generations who have assimilated. Uh, and there are those who are, you know, British, but have maintained a very strong uh, Ukrainian identity, even if the language is not there or weak. Uh, so there's all these different groups and um, and uh, that's going to be just, but that's none of my business. That's the business <laughs> of the, of you know the 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 eparch and and the, the clergy who belong to that eparchy. And I mm. I just have the privilege of of assisting them from time to time in whatever capacity that they uh, that uh, they ask me to. Mm. Well, I'm I'm struck by uh, even the example of Father Peridon, uh almost a hundred years ago. Uh, who uh, wasn't of Ukrainian origin and, and yet uh, was ordained by Sheptitsky. Um, so the, the church being uh, open to all is not a new phenomenon. Uh, I, had, I, I hate to interrupt, but I, I don't want to miss this in case I forget. You brought up Peridon, but I forgot the most important person of, along those lines uh, was Father Joseph Adjan. Mm. Now, Father Joseph Adjan was a French-Canadian from Quebec who he did the call of the Roman Catholic bishops in Canada at the turn of the 20th century to join this mission for these Ruthenians, as we were called, uh, and, and help them re retain their Ukrainian Greek Catholic uh, church. So he joined our church and he became a Ukrainian. You know, that's the way he looked upon himself. Yeah, he knew he was French, but he felt uh, he went to Western Ukraine, Austria to study, and, and that's when the war broke out. He got trapped in this whole thing, and he ended up working for the uh, UNR, the Ukrainian National Republic's foreign ministry. Uh, so he became very, uh, you know, for this cause. Wow. And, and he was sent to England in 1947 to establish that first church and to get the whole thing going. So Bishop Buchko made him the, call it the dean. He was kind of like the first vicar general there. Uh, and, you know, uh, God forbid somebody told him he wasn't <laughs> Ukrainian, but his, his great cause, it wasn't a, a national cause. He supported that, but his cause was the Ukrainian Catholic Church. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, so Father Jean served there from 1947 to 1949. And he was regarded even by the great uh, leaders, the political leaders of not only in England, but in other places, our Ukrainian uh, national and nationalist uh, you know, uh, the, the leaders uh, as a patriot. And they respected him very much uh, because they saw that he, he, his whole heart was uh, for the needs of the people. That's really interesting. And, and it, there's countless examples from history that I, I'm only learning of as an adult. Uh, you know, Cyril Kotolevsky, who was the biographer of Andrzej Szeptycki, was of, of French extraction via... Uh, the Melkite Church, uh, one of my ancestors uh, was Prussian, married into a Ukrainian priest's family. Uh, the phenomenon of the church being um, available to anybody willing to join and adopt our tradition is, is, is not new. And uh, it's worth keeping in mind some of this history as we, as we wander through the world today. Oh, Father Athanasius McVeigh, church historian, thanks so much for joining us on Javet TV. Thank you very much. God bless you. Glory to Jesus Christ. Slava Novike, go to Weber.